All righty. Good morning, everyone. Hi. We are live. I think we did yeah. it. <laughs> and um, we are a start getting uh, started a tiny bit late here, but that's okay. Um, thank you for joining us. And for those of you that can't quite make it, um, of course, this will be recorded. Just a few things before we get started with this wonderful interview that I'm just so excited with my dear friend of many, many years um, is if you do join us, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear where you're from and just comment down below and give us some thumbs up. And if you love what you hear, give us hearts. And um, this, this whole interview today is if you can relate to anything like this. You have been married for many years and you say something and it triggers something in your spouse and he says something back to you and it triggers something in you and in your brain you are going how many times have we been here yep and there's just this downward spiral and you're thinking is there any way to change this yep. yeah that's... every couple <laughs> has that dance that yep frustrating we call it a core pattern that repeats over and over again in marriage. And you just think, why can't we get rid of this? Yep. And we were at the same place at the 15 year mark of our marriage. Yep. And Kay, we, we are going to talk exactly about that. And I love what you have to share. And it's just so, so useful. I share it all the time with my friends and the application is so huge. It's not just for marriage. It's for yep. children and relationships overall. Right. Um, but before we delve into that, I want our audience to get a sense of who you are. So I always love kind of asking a fun question on the front end. So Kay, just so people get a sense of you, what are some things that you love to do that just keep you happy? Well, they're mostly relational. Um, I would say being with my husband is really a, a pleasure and something I love. Um, having... 10 grandkids, that's such a joy to watch Always a, a delight, whole other right? generation <laughs> yeah. grow up. Yeah. And then I think people do wear me out, so how I renew is through creativity, okay. either through ceramics or sewing or painting or something like that. I love that. And again, creativity is um, just, I feel, such a core piece that so often we as women, we miss out on that. And it's such a great way to just really it, it, elevate it, us it, on so many levels. I agree. Yeah, and that really ties into what Beauty Matters is all about because I believe that being created um, in God's image as image bearers, um, part of that is creativity. God That's is right. a creative God, and he expresses himself in beautiful ways. So the more we're in touch with that, I think it's just a really healthy place to be. I, I agree, yeah. and I think everybody's creative in their own way. You may not paint or draw, but you have other areas of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, you guys, if you're joining us, just give us a thumbs up. Give us a shout out. Let us know where you're from. So, Kate, Kate, let's go ahead. And, and I say Kate because I have a Katie That's okay. granddaughter and I have a Kate. I answered anything not granddaughter, okay. <laughs> Daughter-in-law and a Kate. So, um, Kate, share with us your journey a little bit. I mean, you and um, Mylan, your husband, work in a um, counseling ministry called Relationship 180. Mm -hmm. But I know that was a journey for you. Yes. Share with us a little bit your life's journey and what brought you to Relationship okay. 180. So. Well, we were at that frustrating point at the 15-year mark in our marriage, and my husband had been in ministry as a pastor for 10 years, and we were worn out. We were burned out, and we just knew something was wrong, and it probably wasn't everybody else. Yeah. So we prayed that very... Well, that's huge. That's, That's right huge there. to say, maybe it's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> so we prayed a very brave prayer in the Psalms. It says, search me, O Lord, know my heart and see if there's any anxious or hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. So we said, Lord, what is it? Mm -hmm. And he was faithful over the next, I'd say, six years to really show us step by step where we were broken inside, where we had developed emotionally. Um, where our families, as loving you know as they were, they just didn't have certain skills to pass along. And so those hampered the way we were able to love each other and love other believers and, eat, of course, our parenting. Mm -hmm. And so we spent really 10 years um, working on ourselves before we ever started a counseling ministry. And then uh, 
God, and when we were ready to go back in ministry, almost 12 years after we quit the ministry, um, Relationship 180 is where God led us, and it's a nonprofit dedicated to helping people um, understand where they're broken, how they can heal, and um, their part in why relationships don't work well. Right. So I want to delve into that a little bit more, but back up just a second. So, okay, my Mylan was in ministry as mm -hmm. a pastor. Right. Were you already a counselor at that time? Because I know you have a degree in marriage and family counseling, right? No, I was not. Um, I went back to school at the tail end of that 12 mm -hmm. years and got my master's in counseling. And uh, so it was after God really took us through a season of growth that I went back to school and became a marriage and family therapist. And Mylan did a lot of pastoral counseling in the ministry. But of course, when you don't understand your own issues, you're, yeah. you're only going to be, you can't lead anyone further than you've gone. And the Bible even says that pupil can't rise above his teacher, but when fully trained will be just like his teacher. So yeah, we had to grow awesome. first. That's amazing though, that after all of that time, you had the wisdom to basically stop and pull back. Was there anything that culminated that was just like, oh my gosh, we've got to change something or else? Yeah, pain. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, yeah. a, a, a church that's, you know, I, I would say we were around 250 in, in membership and attendance. And in a church that size, everybody knows everybody. Yeah. And sooner or later, your weaknesses show up. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like a family. So when there's someone leaves or someone's unhappy, it's very painful. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we didn't understand what dynamics we were bringing to that. Now we do. Right. Um and of course, everyone else had their, their issues too, but uh, we didn't know how to understand those. We didn't have much self-awareness or other awareness. And so that's really um, where we grew. So that is just, I mean, I love, again, something I've so learned from UK is the concept of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I really truly believe that probably the two biggest things that we are called to do in life is to know God and also know ourselves. Right. And I think they completely go, they go hand together. in hand. And I'm not sure which one comes first. I'm not sure it really matters. So tell us a little bit, what is kind of the mission and the purpose of Relationship 180 and how did you land there? Well, the purpose is to, uh, we, we specialize in couples because there's not a great, there's not a lot of, ministries that are really devoted to couples and we believe when you have two people in the room when you're doing the uh, counseling you you begin to see the dynamics of that couple mm -hmm. whereas if you separate them you you don't see those dynamics you have a different person in the room when you put their spouse together yeah. <laughs> and so but surprisingly when you understand the basis of attachment theory which is largely what our work is based on those patterns that we talked about are actually surprisingly predictable. You can think of it as two histories colliding. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're able to kind of see what's going on with a couple probably way before they understand that dynamic mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, I'm sure that just based on what you've seen, you know, I love, you know, in, in um, Song of Solomon, it says nothing new under the sun is kind right. of a theme. So you see those same patterns enacted over and over again. So can you share with us a little bit more in depth about attachment theory? Because I think that really is sort of the core philosophy yeah. um, that you... Well, attachment theory is about 80 years old. And basically what they did is look at how... Um, moms and dads interact with young children, 18 months of age, and they stress the child by having the mom or the dad leave the room and see what the child does. And then they have the mom come back and they're looking to see, does that child seek comfort from the mother and try and, uh, is the mother able to calm the child after a stressful situation? Because what they've realized that it's in the first five years of life that we really learn how to manage difficult emotions. And we either learn to manage them well, or we learn to manage them with reactivity. Mm -hmm. And the main areas of reactivity are to um, flee, detach, go away, mm -hmm. uh, to freeze, like I don't, I'm scared, I'm, I don't like conflict, or to protest and fight. So we have five love styles. The avoider is the person who distances under emotional stress. They came from families where no parent ever asked, how are you? 
What do you feel? They don't have a vocabulary for their internal world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when they marry, they're very steady eddy. They don't have a lot of ups and downs because they don't feel. Yeah. And so um, people marry them because they're consistent and predictable. But over time they realize they really have no ability to connect on an emotional level because they didn't really learn that growing up. Wow, okay, yeah. And when you think about it, Jesus wasn't an avoider. No. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. you know, when you think of each of these love styles, you can see the broken part. Right. And that was my love style coming into marriage and parenting. And so when uh, there was conflict, I wanted to dodge. I wanted to detach. I wanted to, um, uh, you know, remove myself and fix it as quickly as I could. And if you ask me how I felt, avoiders only have one answer to that question. Fine. Fine. Exactly. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Fine. I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine. Yeah. And it's not like they're lying. They really don't have a range of emotions. So that was a big growth goal for me. And I needed a feeling wordless to be do able to do Do they not that. have emotions or they just don't have the ability to express? Well, when you think about it, every two-year-old has emotions. Yeah, it's what our true. parents teach us to do with those emotions. And in my family, if I cried, my dad got mad, my mom got anxious. And so you learn to not show your emotions. And then over time, you're not paying any attention and it's not safe. So you just learn not to have them. And I think they're down deep somewhere inside. Yeah. But... Uh, there's something that it's just not accessed. You yeah. have to learn. It's like, almost like that part of development didn't happen correctly. And you have to go back and learn the language of emotions and what your body's telling you about what emotion you have. And if you don't know what you feel, you won't know what you need. Yeah. yeah. Because feelings link to needs. Yeah. So you talked about the avoider. Share very briefly the other styles and then when your whole concept of how that plays into a marriage. Okay. The dynamic. The next style is the pleaser, and this is the person who freezes. Mm -hmm. Pleasers grow up in homes where um, they they take care of the parents, maybe because there's an angry or critical parent, maybe because there's a high need sibling. But these kids learn that they need to manage the emotions Mm -hmm. of the parent. And so they're very good at reading other people. They like to be in the giving role because that's what they grew up doing. They kind of were the good kid growing up. And they look like super nice Christians. Yeah. (laughs) Um, The trouble is uh, they don't know how to get angry. They're very uh, unaware of any angry emotions. Um, They don't like conflict. So they'll avoid conflict because someone might be mad at them. Mm -hmm. They're very uncomfortable when anyone's mad at them. And it's all about... um, if you're okay, I'm okay. Yes. If you're upset, I'm upset. So their emotions ride on other people's Every, emotions. Yeah. And that's a hard way to live. So my husband was a pleaser, which is why he burned out in the ministry, because he couldn't oh, please God. everybody. <laughs> yeah, bad combo as a pastor. Right. And yeah. so um, and when you think about it, Jesus was tender, but he was also tough. Mm-hmm. And he could also say no and call out things that were wrong. And... So pleasers need to learn to do that. The third is the vacillator. This is a person who had inconsistent connection growing up. And many times they um, they had a parent who could show up and really connect and then would sort of go away. And there was no rhyme or reason as to when that parent might come back again. Mm-hmm. So the kids kind of left in a position of wanting more, but feeling like they're powerless to make it happen. It's got to be the parent that's in the mood to do it. So they grow up feeling a lot of preoccupation about why does that parent go away and why can't they connect all the time and they idealize the future and think that when they're dating they have found their soulmate because there's a lot of time there's a lot of attention and that's what they've been looking for but then when you marry and have a job and kids and all this you have to wait and there's time apart and that's when the vacillator gets triggered um, and they feel angry when they're disappointed And they're disappointed a lot because their standard is very ideal and they don't really know why they're such perfectionists. But if if you think about it, if I can make my life ideal up here, then I never have to feel any pain. Yeah, yeah. And so they have a hard time between this gap between reality and ideal. And so they're always wanting everybody, their kids, their spouse to be up here. And when they're not, they're angry, they protest. Um, They'll please to make connection happen. Avoiders and pleasers don't protest. Um, Vacillators do protest. And then sometimes they'll go away and 
try and figure that all out and be an avoider for a while. So they're kind of a combination, but the key point is the anger is in the middle part of that dynamic. And it sounds like from what you're saying that a lot of that is triggered by um, um, unachievable expectation. Is that correct? So you're always expecting your expe and right. that expectation drives right. You know, yeah, that expectation and they don't even really realize what idealist mm -hmm. they are. But so they kind of swing between all good and all bad. Every day is either great or every person or everything or when they're disappointed, it's all bad. They don't have a, a middle ground. Mm -hmm. And so and that's a painful way to live because you're kind of living on the ceiling or on the floor and you can't stay. You can't find middle ground. Mm -hmm. So one of the growth goals for the vacillator, and I love, this was a quote from a vacillator. She said, every day I tell myself, when I wake up, today isn't going to be as good as I think it's going to be. Oh, okay. So set a realistic set expectation. Set a realistic expectation. Yeah. Just know this isn't going to be a perfect day. It's not going to be all good because we live in a broken world. Yeah. And then when something bad happens, she says, I say to myself, hey, this isn't as bad as you think it is. It's not all bad. They're yeah. still good. And she says, I'm learning to find middle ground. That's Beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, even in terms of relating to people, that's such a difficult burden that you're putting on people when you right. expect them to always right. be everything at all things. Right. right. And then the second they, you know, screw up, they basically become all bad. Right. That, that's right. And uh, yeah. vacillators really think the problem is out there. If you could fix my spouse, I would be fine. They don't realize that their abandonment history, whether it was blatant, like someone mm -hmm. left or it was more subtle, a parent was home but not accessible uh -huh. emotionally, mm -hmm. um, that that history impacts how they view other people. Mm -hmm. And that's a big learning goal for the vacillator. Wow, yeah. And then is, there is a fourth type too, The right? fourth type is kind of a combo because this is a chaotic home mm -hmm. where there's just um, fright without solutions. And in this home, kids are left um, to fend for themselves or they're neglected. They may be abused. They may be traumatized. They may be... Um, left at home with no resources mm -hmm. and so these kids can kind of go in a bunch of different directions mm -hmm. they may become a controller uh, they're more feisty mm -hmm. they'll finally fight that dominant parent usually in these homes there's a one up and a one mm -hmm. down and they'll they'll be feisty enough to fight that dominant parent and they make a vow somewhere along the way I'm never gonna let anyone control me ever wow. again okay yeah. and they need that control to stay away from any any uncertainty, any any risk of being shamed, terrorized, all those terrible feelings. I mean, for them as kids, difficult emotions were overwhelming. And so if I have control, I can manage my world so I don't have to feel these wow. things. And then the, the more compliant child could become the victim. And we, we say a victim is someone that just learned to tolerate the intolerable. Okay. Now, these people also come up and say to us, well, I feel like I'm everything. And my next question is always, did you have a really hard childhood? And they, they always, always say yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And, you know, when you think about it, it worked in my home to be an avoider. Everyone got along better and the parents were happier if there were no feelings. Yes. It worked in my own home to be a pleaser. In this home, nothing works. So we just say, if you don't relate to the controller or victim, then pick the style you think you do the most and the relationship you most want to change. Yeah. And that could yeah. be the vacillator. It could be the victim. It could be the pleaser. Um, and... You can go online at howwelove.com and take a test to help mm -hmm. you determine what style you think you, you might be. So, Kay, all of these, what I'm hearing as you're describing all these styles, bottom line is it's all about pain avoidance and managing pain, right? Yes. And, and because all of us are broken, and so that pain manifests itself in different ways. So how does that work in a marriage? Well... Each of these styles has a predictable way that they react in marriage and they have predictable triggers. Um, and so for an example, if you're like Mylon and I and a voider marries a pleaser, you're going to have a chasing where the pleaser is always fearfully wondering if the avoider's mad mm -hmm. and asking, are you okay? Are you okay? And the avoider's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and you know, so you have that dance that goes around and around. And each of these, when you have two styles come together, you'll have histories colliding. But one of the main things is there's no ability for a spouse to recognize stress in another person and comfort each other instead of reacting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, avoiders can't comfort because they can't go to painful emotions. Uh -huh. Pleasers just want you to be happy. They don't want you crying. Vacillators just get mad. They don't get sad. Same with controllers. And victims have cut off their feelings and they dissociate a lot. So 
we either learn growing up that people are a safe resource for comfort, mm -hmm. and when we're not okay, we can go to a person, mm -hmm. or we learn people don't really know how to help me when I'm not okay, so I go to a thing or a behavior um, mm -hmm. that brings me relief, but it also blocks intimacy in my current relationship. Yeah. Well, I love, and I remember just from all the many, many conversations we've had is that concept of comfort, mm -hmm. right? And, yes. and I remember you saying early on that in most of the adults that you and Mylan interview, very few can remember moments of being comforted. And right. why, why is comfort such an integral part? Why is that so important? Well, comfort um, is something when you think of an infant, uh, an infant has only one language and that's to cry and a parent tries to soothe that in a good circumstance many many times a baby's in distress of various degrees and needs soothing way through all through life but yeah. particularly in the first six yeah. years when they're learning to really regulate their own emotions and if you have great periods of soothing then you you develop neural pathways that help you regulate your own stress yes. and help you calm down when you're not okay but if you didn't have good soothing or it was very sporadic or you had it as an infant, but it stopped when you were 18 months mm -hmm. old, then you're left with a lot of distress and you, you have to manage it on your own. And that becomes normal and natural. Whereas, and I think in God's economy, all the one another's of scripture are comfort one another, encourage one yes. another, um, you know, be kind to one another. Um, and all these things require Love vulnerability. One Love one another. <laughs> there, yeah. Yeah. And I, I can't, do that if there's not a vulnerable vulnerability where someone's coming to me and saying I'm really discouraged or I'm really anxious or I'm really nervous or um, I feel very overwhelmed and these are things that we're not going to be able to do if we didn't grow up in a home where that was safe right. to do. So in your counseling how do you teach people those skills? How do you teach them to provide comfort and to create intimacy and to mm -hmm. change that dance? Well first of all we we help them learn what is their love style what is the broken attachment it's not a temperament it's not it's not a personality it's an injury okay. and an injury is something that can be healed once it's diagnosed mm -hmm. but you have to understand you know when I knew I was an avoider and I had a definition I was like I had a growth plan mm -hmm. and there's a workbook that goes along with the book how we love which is a very extensive workbook and so there's a growth a chapter for each of these styles and a, a, you know, a lot more information about how to grow. But we have to have ownership of the style mm -hmm. from each person. And then we're helping them to understand that their core dynamic is created from those styles colliding. And then we're teaching them um, to have conversations and regulate their emotions during those conversations. So they're not fight, fighting, they're not fleeing, they're not freezing. Mm -hmm. And we're helping them through those natural tendencies so that they learn to go around is what we call the comfort circle. It can start out as a discomfort circle. It usually, um, probably it usually, probably does, usually right? does. But <laughs> yeah. over time, when you learn to grow out of your attachment wound and you learn how to regulate your emotions well enough to stay engaged and talk about emotions, mm -hmm. then what you'll see is that core pattern starts to diminish. Yeah. And I had no idea how amazing that would feel or the freedom of being out of that core pattern. Yeah. But our goal is to help couples escape that core pattern because you have two choices either it will dominate you or you will learn to manage and dominate it yeah i i just love the hope that i hear in all of mm -hmm. that and again I, I i think there's something so powerful about naming something yes and again as we said early on it's about understanding yourself but in a marriage basically in a marriage you are one so right. in a way you understand your husband too and it's so interesting because so much of this is about creating a framework and so often we operate from everybody thinks like me everyone feels like me right and that is like probably the the biggest is the biggest fallacy out right. there because right. I know we're all created uniquely so when you have this framework where you can understand he thinks differently this is he feels differently and I do and then you can change that dance right? that's right and understanding too, I think, you know, the things that irritated me so much about Mylan in the first 15 years were his, that anxious kind of pursuing that he was always doing and asking me so many times, <laughs> how are you? And I'm fine. And then... <laughs> and that, you would respond that way. Yeah. And I, fine. Leave I me alone. <laughs> kind of later to define that I felt like my, I was always having my emotional temperature taken, but the trouble was I didn't have any emotions. Mm -hmm. So 
that dance um, was very frustrating, but it was also something that we could change and heal. Yeah. And, you know, we all have those core dances. Yeah. And that is just the hope and the mission in your work with Relationship 180 and your, through your books and everything is healing, right? Well, right. There's and, hope in there. And I'll add one more thing to that. You have to understand your spouse's history. You have to go back and understand what was it like for your spouse when they were 10, when they were 5, mm -hmm. when they were 2. Because until I understood Mylon's history, I realized his anxiety came out of having a very angry parent who could be very nurturing and then very explosive. And so he was always monitoring that parent to make sure he could try and predict the explosions. So he grew up in a home where he had to monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a home where no one was monitoring anybody. But when I began to hear his, memory, his memories, that irritation shifted to compassion. Yeah, and that's huge. a big part of our ministry is to help people see that what bugs you the most about your spouse probably has a wound sitting under it. Wow, that is so, can you say that again? That is so yeah, profound. Yeah, whatever bugs you the most about your spouse probably has a wound sitting under it. They do that behavior because of a wound they experienced in childhood. And when you begin to understand that and, and have compassion, it takes a lot of the irritation irritability out of the relationship and probably moves you into a place irritability is a much different emotion than compassion compassion right. irritability makes you want to withdraw where compassion moves you into a place where you can empathize and give right, right. and then right. you can also become that source of comfort when you understand that that mm -hmm. wound and that brokenness right exactly yeah that is just so beautiful so share with us a little bit about how this applies to parenting oh in every way uh, because, you know, your broken style is going to impact how you parent. As an avoider, if my kids cried, what did I tell them? You're fine. Yeah, exactly. Not like, tell me more or, you know, what's making you feel like mm -hmm. that or... So, you know, my kids were in late junior high and um, late elementary and then we had a one-year-old when we started to learn this. And so mm -hmm. we just put a feeling wordless on the refrigerator and we begin to use it in, mm -hmm. in conversations. Um, and we told the kids, we grew up in families where they, we didn't learn how to process or manage our emotions. So we're going to try and learn to do that right along with you. And occasionally there was pushback, especially from the boys. Um, uh, but I remember one time just saying, well, you can have the car keys when you tell me three feeling words because you are not okay and you're stressed and you're stressing the family. And so we're going to have this talk before you can Go. have the car keys. Yeah. <laughs> that worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. So it really, um, so what I hear you saying is you teach that, that your family culture becomes one where emotions are um, respected in a way and identified and verbalized. Right. right. And and you're teaching your children. I mean, when they're little, it might be just mad, sad, glad, and scared. As you're older, you're trying to add to that list of feeling words. And um, there's a list of feeling words on our website. Mm -hmm. Um, howwelove.com and it's a uh, it's on freebies there's all kinds of resources if you go to the freebies tab mm -hmm. there's a feeling words list there which is a great piece of paper to have in conversations and there's also a guide for the listener because most people when we're doing the comfort circle we ask one person to stay in the listener role for an extended period of time which means you have to learn to ask good questions mm -hmm. and most people don't know how to do that so there's also a list of questions for the listener and we encourage you to go all the way through all those questions before you switch roles. Oh, I love that. Because yeah. that's something you can actually do with your spouse then, too, right? right? Not just your children. Right. Because, yeah, that questions are very hard. Um, yeah. Listening well and then asking good questions that aren't sort of rhetorical. Right? Or entrapping. Or entrapping. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm going to lead you down with these questions into admission. And yeah. That's not good listening. That's just trying to prove your point. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. Okay, so really quick before um, we move forward, going back to parenting, so helping your children identify their feelings. Irregardless of family, I'm guessing, and I'm thinking back of, you know, my children having three sons, mm -hmm. and, and you know my three sons, yeah. and one of them was a very obvious vacillator. Yeah. So is it helpful for parents to kind of know, I mean, is there sort of an inborn attachment style, even though kids grow up in the same family? Uh, 
you know, so many things impact each kid. And even though they grew up in the same family, it's at a different season. And I was a twin, so we were born at the same time, but my mom responded very diff differently mm, to us because my sister was more responsive and I was more internal and I made my mom anxious. So every child has a different experience based on the birth order and based yeah. on where the parents are at and what kind of stresses the parents are under. And just life happens and it's mm -hmm. a broken world, mm -hmm. so sometimes stressful circumstances. But I think, you know, what you're looking for is when you, ha when, you know, the book that we wrote, How We Love Our Kids, helps you understand if you have a child that you see is becoming a vacillator or an avoider or a pleaser, it gives you specific things you can do to start to turn them. The goal is to become a secure connector. And a secure connector is just someone who knows how to manage their emotions, mm -hmm. express their emotions, can regulate themselves, which means you're not going into anger or detachment or pouting, or mm -hmm. you're able to manage difficult emotions, you're able to take them to people, you're able to receive comfort. Um, these are all things that, that if we can shift that around when they're kids, how great. I mean, yeah. they don't have to shift it around once they're married. What a gift to give yeah, to their exactly, spouse. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that is that is so true. I remember, um, Kay, one of the the um, best pieces of advice you gave me, having a vacillator mm -hmm. and, um, you know, really realizing the way you parent isn't the same for all of them. We all have different needs. And, right. and this was one who he, because one of the characteristics of vacillator children, probably adults, is they give you this push-pull right. messaging, so Come it's hard here, to read go them. Away. Here, go yeah. away. So, I love you, I hate you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so my child, who was the vacillator when he was in kindergarten, this is an example of a vacillator, he came home and I said, so how did you like your teacher? And he goes, I really liked her. In fact, I like her better than you. <laughs> Yeah, the best of your kids know how to pick that one thing out that's really going to get you. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you don't, I, th I do think by temperament, these kids are born with probably a sensitive temperament. Mm -hmm. And they're very aware if, are you here and present or are you here but detached? Yes. And they're always doing this to yeah. the parent. <laughs> And so it's really important with these kids to realize they probably have a greater level of sensitivity and a higher need for connection, yep. which is how they're wired. And they have a real radar for when that's truly happening and when it's yep. not. And so they need time and attention that's really focused and non-distracted. And other kids will let you get by with not giving them that, but the vacillator child won't tolerate it. Well, and again, what a great tip you told me is when they're pushing you away, what they're really saying is, I feel unloved and right. I need validation that you're loved. And you told me when he behaved that way to say, I feel like you need me to hug you right, right. now. Yeah. And you said, hug them until they make eye contact. And the first time I did this, and it was this changing dance, because normally when he would say, go away, I don't like you, or right. you're a bad mommy, or whatever he would say, you know, we go into that, you're not allowed to say right. that role. Right. And I just, the first time I said, you know what, I'm really feeling like you need a hug. And he looked at me and he said, then why don't you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a breakthrough, I'll tell you. It is. It is. It was, yeah. So, and we still, um, he's very well in tune with his vacillating yeah. tendencies. And so that was really great. Well, Kate, so you mentioned your books. Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, you know, our readers about your books and how the best way to get them. Well, uh, you can get the books on the website or Christian booksellers or Amazon, any of those sites. And the names are How, how We Love, love uh -huh. and How and We Love Our Kids. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, the corresponding workbook. And you want to make sure if you get the expanded version of How We Love mm -hmm. because we revised and added to the book in uh, the summer, this summer. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this last summer. And so you don't want the original copy. You want the revised copy. And I think it says, it says expanded version. And then there's also a lot of resources on our website. We do a six hour workshop on how we love, how we love our kids and how we love sex or don't, which we don't have a book for. But um, you're gonna write yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, everyone <laughs> wants us to write that one. Um, and so, you know, if you can't attend a workshop, you can always, some people aren't readers and they prefer to learn verbally or, you know, watching. Mm -hmm. And so that's an, another option. And there's a small group curriculum if you wanna take your small group through the material, which we've just heard great 
feedback from. So that's yeah. another option. So that would be like in a Bible study group or yes. not even. Yeah. Yes. And it is obviously faith based, but I think the principles, no matter what your faith is, are yeah. so profound. Yes. I, I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, to everyone. Okay, so you have How We Love, How We Love Our Children, the workbook, and then the website is howwelove.com. All right. Right. And then for people, Kay is located in Orange County. So I know you currently are not yeah. counseling. You've retired yourself from that. Um, but you do the, the workshops together. Yes, Milan we do the still, workshops right? together. Yeah. And then our counseling center has great therapists that are trained in the How We Love um, attachment perspective. Mm -hmm. And... Um, even there, we stay pretty full, even though we have um, eight therapists working with us. So, uh, but if you're looking for a counselor and you're not in the area, try and find someone who is familiar with attachment theory and familiar with, and comes from a developmental perspective. Uh, because we really believe you need both people in the room and you need to understand what didn't develop that should have developed in a, in a more... Um, positive situation or just, you know, I wouldn't even say positive. I would say parents that just were given the tools so that they could hand them down. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, really quickly too is, um, someone just put something on there. Oh, got it. Thank you for posting that link. Whoever did that. That is, that's awesome. Um, your part of your ministry too is pastoral counseling, right? Yes. Yeah, so we have a real heart for Christian leaders. Yeah, yeah. We just did a workshop for the family life staff in Little Rock, Arkansas. And they do so much work with marriages. And so we really have a heart for helping Christian leaders understand this. Uh, they understand who they're working with and they can improve their own marriage and have a solid foundation there so they don't leave the ministry over a broken marriage. Yeah, wonderful. So again, so in wrapping things up, I think we kind of covered, was there any other resources that we should mention? I think we kind of... I think we've got it, yeah. Okay. Um, so Kay, in Beauty Matters, we always ask our guests to leave us with a quote. Can you, is there something on your heart? I you do have a favorite qu quote. Um, it's pick your pain because it's painful to be stuck in a core pattern, yeah. wow. but it is painful to grow. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. And if you just get the workbook and do five things, you're, you're okay. Growth is uncomfortable because it means you have to do something new, which is always uncomfortable mm -hmm. because it's out of your norm and comfort zone. However, the pain that you experience growing has a productive end, whereas mm -hmm. the pain of being stuck has no productive end. So we just say pick your pain. You might yeah. as well pick the pain of growth versus the pain of being stuck. Yeah, absolutely. And that, again, is just so in alignment with what comes out from so many of our guests is there is really... It's kind of like yes or no, isn't it? There's mm -hmm. two choices. And we do have the choice of staying in a protectionist, stuck place, right. or moving forward in growth. And the beautiful thing about growth, it's continual, isn't it? It's like, that, isn't that what life is? Yes. Life is about growth, and right? Even when yeah. it comes to parenting, people get so upset, they mess their kids up. And I'm like, hey, there's no perfect parent. Be a growing parent. Yes. If you can be a growing parent and your child, even as an adult, can say, my mom is different today than she was five years ago, in yeah. a good way. Yeah. Um, what a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And that is so true, especially as our children grow. And we have to grow, especially they're not the same kids. They right. become adults. So. Right. Not to grow. Okay. It is just, yeah, I, I, I love learned you, so, so, so much. Thank you. You are a blessing to so, so many people. And we hope we were just a blessing to all of you today. Um, we'll put some of those resources down below, the book and the website. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, also on the website, how we love, if you want to get continual newsletters and everything, mm -hmm. just leave your contact information, yeah. your email, and then you'll be added on the um, how we love ongoing. Yeah, we don't, we don't solicit anything. Yeah. We just send out newsletters that are helpful for you in growth. That's yeah. And we don't send a lot, so yeah, you won't yeah. be overwhelmed with emails. Yeah. And feel free to share. If you, this has been a blessing, just go ahead and share it on your page as well. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.